This is one of the most efficient wood burning stoves in the world. It's called a rocket mass heater and I built it on my back porch. I'm going to show you how I did it. If you don't care as much about the nitty gritty details of how it's built, I put a link to a super short time lapse version of this project down in the comments section. It's only a few minutes long for those that just want a visual summary. When I say this wood stove is one of the most efficient in the world, what does that mean? How I see it, there are two big measures of stove efficiency. The first metric is how completely the stove converts wood into thermal energy. The second metric is how effectively the stove transfers that heat energy into your living space. It's this heat transfer variable that makes a rocket mass heater so special. Let me show you what I mean. Most stoves will connect the combustion chamber immediately to a chimney that runs up straight through your ceiling. This delivers the vast majority of the heat energy in the exhaust directly to the outside world. A rocket mass heater instead runs a long length of exhaust pipe through an earthen bench before finally delivering the exhaust gas outside. This bench soaks up the heat energy and then releases it back to your living space over the next half day or so. The air that ultimately comes out of your chimney is significantly cooler when you're working with a rocket mass heater, often even cool enough to touch the stove pipe with your bare hands by this point. This is because most of the heat was pulled into the earthen bench where it can heat your house for hours after the fire goes out. Let's look at an example of how this works. Here are two model stoves with mostly identical metal parts. The only real difference is the brick, which is meant to represent the earthen bench on a rocket mass heater. Let's put them both into the same oven at 350 degrees for one hour. The oven brings both stoves up to operating temperature, much like burning a firewood. Then let's place the little hot stoves in a box and measure the amount of heat they give off to their environments over time. See the difference? The brick stove heated the box up to 90 degrees and kept it warm for 6 hours. The traditional metal stove, on the other hand, barely heated the box at all. This means a rocket mass heater keeps your house warm long after the fire has gone out, and that means you save money on firewood. The term rocket mass heater implies the presence of a large earthen thermal mass to act as the heater. At the core of this heater, though, is a rocket stove. Let's do a super quick review of the parts of a rocket stove. This is a rocket stove. Notice the overall J shape. This J shape is fairly universal to rocket stoves. The parts of a rocket stove are the feed tube, a burn tunnel, and a heat riser. I'll use these terms throughout this video. With a rocket stove, you place your fuel wood into the feed tube like standing sticks. Then you start the bottom tips of the sticks on fire. Because the heat riser pulls so much air through the stove, the rushing air moving over the bottom of the burning sticks pulls the fire sideways. That's why this horizontal part is called the burn tunnel. Pretty much all of the fire is pulled sideways into this part. Now that you know the parts of the J-shaped rocket stove that lives inside a rocket mass heater, let me show you how we use these parts to push hot air sideways through 20 feet of ductwork built into the earthen bench. Let's take a look at the heat riser on a rocket mass heater. It's made of fire brick. It's also wrapped in ceramic blanket to insulate it. This keeps the air inside the heat riser super hot. The hotter this air is, the faster and stronger it flows. Then once the barrel or bell is in place, it sits with a little gap between the top of the heat riser and the flat surface of the barrel. This allows the air to shoot up out of the top of the heat riser and swirl down around the sides. Since the bell is made of metal, it radiates heat off of the sides, thus cooling the air inside the bell. Because relatively cold air falls compared to hot air, this creates a downdraft in the air contained inside the bell. The combination of the rapidly rising air inside the heat riser and the relatively cooler falling air inside the bell are the engine that drives air through this entire stove. This airflow is what pushes the hot air through the winding ducts inside the earthen bench. A rocket mass heater uses just a small fraction of the wood it takes for a traditional wood stove to heat a room. The most costly components to build it are the fire brick and the HVAC duct, but aside from that it is made mostly of dirt, sand, clay and straw, and blood, sweat and tears. Now I'm going to show you how I built it, but first, a disclaimer. Any stove if not built safely can burn your house down and potentially hurt or kill someone. When you play with fire you can get burnt. The fire codes are complex and I advise each and every one of you to do your own research and consult with local experts before you attempt to build or god forbid copy anything I do here. I will do my best to demonstrate safe principles but nothing you see here is guaranteed to be either safe or code compliant. 
With that out of the way, let's do a high-tech transition back in time to the day I started to build this thing. Uh, so step one is to level the ground with something that's very flame-proof so you don't put the heat down into the concrete too much, too hot, because you can achieve super hot burns uh, well above 1,000 degrees. Uh, you don't want to crack the cement. In my case, I plan on using uh, perlite and clay mixed together. I'm going to put that down, screed it to a rough flatness, and then lay my base of fire bricks from over here. I'm going to build them in a certain shape, which I tried my best to outline in white. Uh, this kind of cross shape is where the bricks are going, and that center circle represents where the oil drum is going to go on top of the heat riser. All right, so we're about to mix up some clay stabilized perlite. So I'll go through the general ingredients of what this is. What they call clay slip is a 50-50 mixture. So one part clay, one part water. Winds up looking about like this. So kind of a slurry clay water. So that's what I'll be using to help bind the perlite together. But the rough proportions of clay slip per unit volume of perlite is about a half gallon of clay slip per every cubic foot of perlite. I think the dust is fairly well reduced. We're gonna add the clay slip. There's something they call the pinch test, apparently. As I mix this together, you're supposed to be able to pinch a small ball of it between your thumb and finger, and it should still kind of crush or pop. By now, I'm sure most of you will notice the color is quite a bit different from the super white perlite that we started with. And this is about what we're going for. Little ball, I squeeze it and it crushes. So hopefully this is about right. If you see the bubble on the level in the center there, it's pretty obvious that to the right is much lower. So I'm gonna shim up this end here until this reads level. I'll check the dimensions that way too, make sure it's level in both regards. Then I'm gonna screed my perlite so it's flat, and then I can just set my bricks on top, and leveling of each independent brick will be very minimal if I do it right. So it's important when you're doing this to make sure that you really push the perlite down into the form, because you don't wanna leave any big air pockets, especially around the edges. So here I'm laying the first course or the first layer of fire bricks in a very particular pattern. And then you level it, you just basically put the level on, find the high point, and then tap that brick down. And as long as the perlite's still a little bit moist, that high brick sinks nicely down and it just becomes level. So in the next scene here, you're going to see me take the form off. And that's about three days after I laid all this uh, brick on top of the clay stabilized perlite. In the scene where I'm taking this form off, you're going to see me lay cob around the edges of the perlite. I did that because I wanted to make sure that during the continuing construction of the stove, I didn't want to accidentally hit the perlite because it tends to crumble and I didn't want it falling out from underneath the brick and making the whole thing unstable. So I needed to lay a ring of cob or something around the edge of the perlite just to stabilize it. Um, so I went with something called thermal cob. What I'm reading in the book I linked to, um, thermal cob is basically cob that lacks straw. The thought is that you save money on straw uh, and that you don't really need the straw. Um, the problem is without straw, cob cracks. And that's pretty unsettling to be building a stove and watch it crack as you're still constructing it. So as you'll see in future scenes, this thermal cob cracks and that is why I'm not going into the detail right here about exactly how I mixed it because I'm going to go into painstaking detail in future scenes about how to make cob that actually doesn't crack. One of the things that matters when building one of these rocket mass heaters is the cross-sectional area of the fuel tube and the burn chamber and the heat riser all have to be about the same. And so since these bricks will ultimately form the tunnel that the flame is in, the width and the length of the layout of these bricks matters a great deal. And so per what I've been reading, the width should be 7.5 inches. And then the length of this tunnel from here to here should be 24 inches. So all of this is assuming an eight inch diameter tube for the rest of the rocket mass heater. And I'm gonna use clay slip to act as mortar. So 50-50 mixture of 
water and pottery clay into kind of a slurry here. We're jumping to the top course of half bricks that are building what's called the heat riser. It's important when laying these bricks to rotate the course so that the seams of each brick don't line up. It's more stable if the seams rotate around rather than having all the seams line up. In the laying of these bricks, I would recommend looking at a diagram found in a book or online somewhere because it can be quite detailed. So this is clay slip. Some people use mortar, which is clay slip mixed with some sand. In the book I'm reading, they're reporting that they have good results with just clay slip. They don't seem to need mortar. Basically butter the edges with this clay and then lay it in place. And the goal is to have this level. And you can see there's a seam here. So it's important for this next one then, you don't line that seam up. It calls for seven courses of these half bricks to form the heat riser. I'm going a little bit off script here. I'm gonna go a little bit taller. From what I've read, going slightly taller is something that is allowable. You won't be punished functionally speaking. Everything still works fine. You do not wanna go shorter. That will not work fine. And as I go up each course of bricks, I always check with a level as you go. From what I've read, clay slip is incredibly fire resistant which is kind of not intuitive because it sure looks kind of fragile. Looks like chocolate. Like I've already mentioned, the diameter of the tunnel matters a great deal. You don't want to go off script on that. Another thing that matters a great deal is the clearance at the very top of the heat riser. There's going to be an oil drum, 55 gallon drum is going to go upside down over this and you want a two inch gap between the heat riser and whatever surface, so the lid, so to speak. So the concept here is you tap down the high points and if you've got enough clay slip in there, it will squirt out kind of around the sides. That does mean you have to start off with enough extra clay slip in there. Recap of what I did primarily in time-lapse, everything from this point down is full-size fire bricks. Those are standard dimensions. And everything from here up, these are all half fire bricks. The way that I copied this from the book I'm reading allowed for me to make very minimal cuts. There is only two cut bricks in this entire structure. One of them is here. You had to cut this to seven inches in length. And then the other one is here. So only two bricks had to be cut. I used a masonry blade on my angle grinder to get that done. I'm allowing my thermal cob to dry thoroughly. Obviously it's cracking. Again, thermal cob doesn't have any straw in it. I think I'm gonna depart from what I'm reading in the book and ignore thermal cob henceforth. 
from now on all my cob I'm going to include straw in it to hopefully help reduce the amount of cracking. And then I think I also over moistened this cob as it was going down. Uh, so I'm going to do it a little bit drier with the addition of straw. Hopefully I won't have cracking uh, with further, further cob parts of this bench. So the next steps now are to prep our 55 gallon drums by burning the paint off. I'll show you how that's done. Removing the paint is important because you don't want to have the paint burn off inside your house or on your porch. This technique is what they call the pocket rocket technique. Basically you cut two holes in the lid of this drum and then you put one tube. This is just a six inch duct. You basically set it in, mark it, and then you raise it up and then I'm gonna cut and flare this. And then in this hole, you put a second duct that goes up. And when all that's done, you light a fire in the tube going down. And since it doesn't quite touch the bottom, the flames blow around the bottom, swirl up and then rise up the chimney and go out that way. And the heat of that burns the paint off. The tube that goes down and stops four inches above the bottom of the barrel, that's installed. I installed it with just some self-tapping sheet metal screws. I installed the chimney. I made it nice and tall because you want draft to pull the air up. So a tall chimney helps keep the flow of air going. You can see the fire still being pulled down. The paint is off. Check relatively easily. If you see an old sticker like that and you wanna know, you rub a stick on it and if it just ashes off like that, that means it's burnt. So one barrel down, but we're gonna burn the paint off the other barrel and keep moving on. All right, so here we have our two 55 gallon drums with all the paint burnt off. And I'm just showing you the general scheme of how they're going together. So I got the top of the upper one facing up and I got the top of the bottom one facing down. So these two are the two bottoms of the tanks are touching. And then I use the ring band clamp that comes with these drums. And I put it around the two bottom lips and then put the bolt through to hold them together. And so with the two bottom lips touching from each drum, the band clamp's holding them butt to butt. So both open ends are facing apart from each other. And this way, the upper one is gonna ultimately have its lid put on top. And that's gonna be fastened in place with its band clamp. We'll just set it here, pretend that's on. So that will form the bell that goes over the heat riser, which is the bricks that I've already mortared together. This bottom drum is gonna have to be cut to a precise shape that fits around the brick structure. And again, the most important part of what this total height is, is that you want the flat surface of the bell to be just two inches above the top of the brick heat riser. So what I did is I found a two inch piece of scrap steel and I'm using that as a spacer. Now if I imagine that the lid of the drum is the top of this piece, all I have to do is measure the distance down to the surface that the combined barrels are gonna sit on. And then with the combined barrels bolted to each other in the background, then I can just measure from the top all the way down to where that length is and chop the lower barrel like so. A detail to keep in mind though, is that when you measure on the drums where you're cutting them, the rim of the drums comes up a little bit higher and then the lid kind of comes down a bit until it gets to the other rim. So that lid being a little bit closer down means that when I'm measuring my length, I have to add the difference in the two. So when I'm making my measurements to cut the edges of the drum, I'm gonna have to add back a quarter of an inch just because if I did it right at two inches, the lid is now a quarter inch lower. So I gotta bring the whole thing up a quarter inch higher. Hope that makes sense.
So the lower drum is referred to as the manifold, since that's kind of permanently in place. I'm gonna grout it in there. And then the top barrel is called the bell. Uh, ultimately, the bell and the manifold are gonna be held together with the rings that the barrels came with. So you clamp these together with a little bit of stove gasket in there. The earthen material stops about at the height of this. And that's why I made this riser and this whole system a little bit taller than the instructions called for. I wanted this seam to be well above the earth and material so I didn't have to worry about turning a wrench and hitting my, the bench or the cob. And then in the end, the lid for the drum goes on top and you can see the tight clearance with the top of the heat riser. When you set this in place, also with some stove gasket to make it airtight, you clamp that down with the same clamp ring and that's how you form the airtight seal. The whole concept of the thermal siphon is that the outer bell radiates heat and that pulls the hot air downward as it cools because cold air sinks. And the heat riser, the whole point of it is to get the combusting fuel gas oxygen mixture. You want all of that super hot so it's just jetting up out of this thing and swirling around the edges, then cooling off and traveling downwards. Uh, so the next steps are to insulate the heat riser you have to be mindful of what you use because the goal is to get this crazy hot. Uh, you want to use a really high grade material. So fire brick, ceramic blanket, uh, and then to hold the ceramic blanket in place, I'm going to put some hardware cloth around it and some stainless steel wire. And then if y'all saw, I bent the manifold drum. I left some spare material on it and bent some tabs up. Those are meant to be kind of self-centering tabs. So someday if I have to pull this off and put it back in place, those tabs will help pull the upper drum toward the center. I'll see if I can give a quick demonstration without dropping things. But you can see if I'm off a little bit, it kind of guides itself back into place. So even if it's crooked, I can kind of walk away. The aim of that is to make it easier to reinstall the bell. This is ceramic blanket. I got it on Amazon, uh, 129 bucks, and it's rated for 2,400 degrees which should be plenty for my purposes. I'm about to wrap the heat riser in this. This is called hardware cloth. You can get this at most home improvement stores. I'm gonna use that to wrap around the ceramic blanket, and then I'm gonna hold the hardware cloth to itself with my good old safety wire pliers and then some stainless steel safety wire. So now we got our ceramic blanket insulation wrapped around the heat riser. I'm gonna set my barrels back on top. So this piece, as we recall, is called the manifold. So that's going in place. And then once these are both in place, it's time to mark exactly where I plan on having the exit port from the manifold start running the hot air through the, uh, through the earthen bench that I'm gonna build. And I'm positioning it so that there's an equal gap between the brick and the steel. When in doubt, it's best to have the manifold as far back as you can go because that will give you a little extra meat to put some earth material between the manifold piece and the fuel feed. You want to make sure there's a nice gap between the heat riser and the surface here on this side. If you had to pick between this side or the other side, you'd want to scoot the barrel that way, if anything. That way you're increasing the size of the gap, which means the air will be able to flow between the heat riser and the manifold more easily. The number that I read that matters most is you want at least an inch, inch and a half between the heat riser and the wall of uh, the manifold. I definitely have that.
All right, so here we are after a couple quick test burns. I've learned a few things. There's a big gap between the manifold and the bricks and you can see the soot was blowing out here. So I think it's time that I probably mortar the manifold into place on the bricks. So I'm gonna clean up the bricks, get that soot off a bit, and I'm gonna mortar this in place with some clay sand mortar. While I'm at it with the mortar, I'm gonna fix these cracks in the cob. About a week ago, I got a bunch of clay that wasn't being used from a local art school. It came in big 25 pound blocks. It was too dry for them to use any longer. And so I rehydrated that and I combined most of it into this big old trash can because I wanted to kind of average the color out so that the red, pinks, blacks, grays all looked about the same color. So here, I got a big old vat of rehydrated clay that's a nice moist consistency. So I'm gonna use this clay and I'm gonna use some sand that I filtered. And with those two, this filtered sand is very fine. There's no sticks or any big rocks in there. You combine these two. The ratio is three parts filtered sand for every one part hydrated clay. And you add enough moisture to make it a working consistency. And that's how we're gonna make some clay sand mortar. I'm gonna rehydrate it so that's roughly the consistency of slip, which I showed in previous segments. And once I have a nice liquidy product, I'm gonna pour that into the sand to make mixing it easier. One, two, three. All right, mixy, mixy. All right, so now the manifold is mortared into place nicely around the edge. I did a test fire after I hooked the ductwork up and it actually burned very nicely. So this is reassuring that I think it's time to commit and move, move further into the project now. So I figured this is a good time to pause and discuss the layout of the ductwork. To form the ductwork, I used eight inch HVAC duct. Some numbers worth talking about are over the course of the run from the point where the duct exits the manifold all the way to where the duct finally takes its turn to go up the chimney in the back here. From this point to that point, you want at least an inch or two of rise over the course of the duct run. So to get that slope worked out, I used uh, spare bricks and some scrap chunks of tile to make an ever rising slope. So it goes continuously up as it moves toward the chimney. I also had clean outs they advise that you put one near the manifold so you can reach your hand in and clean out any fly ash from the base of the manifold if it ever starts to block the ductwork. And then you want to clean out at every 90 degree bend. And but at the bottom of any vertical segments, you want to clean out so that if stuff falls down, you can get access to that. I had to get these clean outs online. Typically the ones that you find in stores go inside. Uh, you want the type that goes outside according to what I've read. It tends to form a better seal and it's easier to remove. So that's the route I went there. Some numbers worth talking about, since I'm about to start piling earth and material around this whole segment here, we won't be able to see it. So worth pausing to talk about important numbers. We'll call this the front duct, because from where I'm standing, this is the front duct, that's the back duct. So you want the distance from the front duct to where the bench, the earth and material ends. So basically the thickness of the earth material. Right here, you want it to be six inches and then above the top of the front duct, you want a depth, so like essentially a height of six inches of earth material. That number is important because this duct is pulling the freshly burned gases. So this duct is hottest. And so you want a little bit of extra material between the duct and the outside of the earthen bench so you don't burn yourself if you sit on it. So six inches out and six inches up is the depth of earth material required for that duct. You want at least four inches of earth material between the two ducts pretty sure that's just because you need four inches of earth material to make it structurally sound. And then the distance from this duct, the back duct, to the outside of the earthen bench, you want at least five inches of material there. So those numbers are important. 
I'm gonna try and maintain those as I start to build up the earth mass around these ducts. Because it was tedious, I saved you fine folks the misery of having to watch me. To stabilize the chimney run, I used a fender washer and I welded it to the band clamp of the upper barrel. And then I found these specialty straps on mcmastercar.com. These are specially made for eight inch duct work. And there's a little wing nut uh, and it's kind of a, a square headed bolt that helps hold itself still. So using the specialty band, a custom piece of steel band, and then a welded on fender washer to this, that helped give me some vertical stability. In similar fashion, up above here, I did two angled brackets that tie in to my porch uh, to hold this horizontal pipe in a stable place. And then last but not least, I did something similar up here using another eight inch duct hanger and then uh, a piece of rubber and a strap to wrap around the structure of the awning that I built for my porch. Something worth mentioning, to stabilize my 90 degree elbows, I put small tack welds. You can see one right here if you look closely, right there. I put small tack welds so that they couldn't rotate anymore because that would hold it at exactly the angle I wanted. Uh, give it a little extra rigidity. Because the welding ruins the galvanizing process, I used some high temp gray paint to kind of touch that up. So you'll see some gray paint both on that 90 degree elbow and this 90 degree elbow where I put small tack welds in place. I still have yet to put my foil tape on that. You'll see that in a little bit here. Uh, this is just basically a drip ring so that any water coming down the chimney from rain, if it's trying to flow downhill since this pipe slopes slightly, that's just a drip ring to catch any water and drip it outside since eventually there's gonna be a glass wall here. I don't want any water tracking in. And then finally, to stabilize my chimney, you want a nice tall chimney because the taller it is, the more draft you get going and the more effectively it pulls the air up and out. So I had to take several measures to get this thing nice and draft proof. They make many different devices like this up top. I have no brand loyalty. Um, I think that was called a vacuum stack or something, but basically it's a device to where any wind blowing in that disrupts the flow in a way that prevents the wind from being shoved down and causing backflow because that blows smoke out into the room where you're building the stove. In an ideal world, everyone recommends passing the chimney through the attic space and through the roof. And ideally you'd want it to come up at the peak of the house. But because I'm building onto a porch, that just wasn't feasible. So to stabilize this wonky chimney I had to build, I did a couple things. So one, I got something called S5S clamps. These are designed specifically to bolt onto standing seam roofs. These set screws on the side clamp onto the roof. And this bolt on top can be used to bolt things too. So in that way, I was able to fasten some rods to my standing seam roof without having to make any holes in the roof itself. I also picked up some stainless steel rods. You can see here, I got a piece of sheet steel that's also stainless and I cut tabs out of the stainless steel sheet and I welded those tabs to the rod on both ends. So one end bolts to the clamp and one end bolts to some bolts that were passing through the ductwork up top. I decided to use a total of three different rods. These two here help control the pitch so the chimney doesn't fall outward. And then there's one going down kind of up onto the roof that controls the pitch going back and forth. Now with the ductwork and the chimney basically done, I just have to put on the rest of the specialty foil tape and then it's time to start going gangbusters on laying all of the earthen material in the outline here to start to basically build the thermal mass around this entire stove. So anytime throughout this video, you've heard me use the words earthen material or thermal mass, what I'm really talking about is cob. You already saw me pile a little bit of cob around the edges of the perlite, but that cracked. So I didn't wanna go into detail about how to make something that cracks. What I did was I took the same recipe, but this time I added straw and I made this test batch and it did not crack. So this is going really well. I figured this means this is a good time to expand on what cob is. So cob is a term used to describe a natural building practice where you use soil, clay, sand, and straw all mixed together. It's very similar of how you would make an adobe brick, except instead of putting it into a form to make a brick, you kind of gob it all together and smush it down so that it blends into one big glob and then dries into one solid mass. 
This is what we're about to do to form the bench around the rocket mass heater. My local soil was of such poor quality, I went ahead and got something called road base. This has lots of rocks and I've read it's pretty good for building this stuff. Uh, the problem is the rocks are so big that they would cut your feet up if you tried to mix cob in the normal way of putting this on a tarp and stomping on it with bare feet. You'd have bloody nubs after stomping on that. So for this recipe, for every one half part clay, it's one part sand and two parts road base. The way that worked out for this mixture is that's 3.75 liters of rehydrated clay. That's one half five gallon bucket of sand and that's one full five gallon bucket of road base. To expand a little bit on what the clay looks like, it's about the consistency of clay slip. Now I'm gonna add all these components into my cement mixer. There's a particular order I've been adding the ingredients that helps prevent the loss of clay onto the sidewalls of the cement mixer. This is road base. Then I add the clay. And then last, I add the sand. The reason I do it this way is because it buries the clay in between the layers so it doesn't get stuck to the walls of the drum. And if I've done my job well, as this mixes, it'll turn into little spheres instead of sticking to the walls. building with cob you can save a lot of time by mixing in some pretty big rocks in your area. It adds to the structural integrity of the cob and as long as you thoroughly smush the cob around it so that it's bonded to all edges it just saves you time and work so you'll see me incorporate a lot of pretty large rocks into this rocket mass heater bench. So what you see me doing here is using the same ceramic blanket that I used to insulate the heat riser, but this time I'm not using it as an insulator, I'm using it as a type of expansion joint. So where the earthen benches tend to crack is at right angles, coming off of the bricks when those bricks expand on those corners, that tends to crack the bench. So I'm basically just wrapping it in something that has a little bit of give, so that when the bricks expand in the future, when this thing has a fire going, it doesn't expand and crack the earthen material around it. So that's all that is. It's just a glorified expansion joint. Placing the cob around the metal duct, it's important to make sure that the earthen material is always in contact with the metal itself. Because the whole point of this earthen bench is that you're trying to pull heat out of the air inside that metal duct. So to have any sort of air gap between the earth material and the metal duct, or even worse, to have an insulator between the two is horrible. 
Again, the whole point is to pull heat out of that duct into the earthen material. So I took great care while doing this to make sure that I smushed the earth material tied up against the metal at all times. Here you see me holding up some wooden frames that I initially was planning on using to frame the cob around the duct cleanouts. In the long run though, I decided to not go with the square or rectangular frame. Instead, I went with some cheapo plastic flower pots. I'm gonna show that in some detail in later scenes here. So just pretty much ignore that wooden frame.
So when you're laying cob, you wanna have as big a batch wet all at once as possible. And so unfortunately, I can't do the entire bench in one go. So I put a little bit, just about a handful of clay slip in my sprayer here, and I top it off with some water. And then I use this to moisten the old batch of cob to help wet the surface, and that helps the new batch of cob adhere to the top of it. So as I mentioned earlier, to frame the duct cleanouts, I used some cheap plastic flower pots. Y'all just saw me cut the top off of one of those, and then I put it around the cleanout to form kind of a, a frame, so to speak. And then I pile the cob around that ring structure, and until the cob dries, the plastic flower pot helps hold it in place. And because it's plastic and flexible, later on, I'm able to just pull it out of that dried cob to make the cleanout look nice. It actually worked quite well. I'm not sure how other people do it, but I'm a real fan of the fact that I thought that up. Although maybe I didn't think it up. Maybe someone else thought it up, so then... Is it still thinking something up if you're not the first to think it up, you know? It feels like I'm taking credit where it's probably not due. Anyway, it worked. I'm sure there's at least one person out there that is wondering why you keep seeing me poke holes in the cob. A person does that when building with cob if you're about to kind of take a break between layers. So I work a 9 to 5, I'm not able to do this all in one go. So anytime I lay a layer and I know I'm going to have to let it dry to some degree before I have time to get around to laying a wet layer on top of it, I poke little holes just using my fingers, I just poke little dimples all over the layer before it dries. That way when you lay the wet layer on top of it, you smush the wet layer down and that pushes the wet material to form little tentacles that kind of bury down and bind into the dry layer beneath it. So that's why you'll see just intermittently all of a sudden a bunch of little finger holes appear because I'm, I'm doing that on purpose. It's when I know that I'm going to have to let that layer dry to some degree before I get around to laying something on top of it. That little 2x4 there is just meant to be a depth gauge that makes sure that I'm building the top of the cob right to where it's going to be flush with the top of those bricks and I want the bench the same height all over the porch uh, so I, you'll see me lay the 2x4 up against the bench as I'm laying the cob down just to make sure the height is the same everywhere. So at this point, the bulk of the cob work is done. As you can see, I ran out of the homogenized kind of gray colored clay, and in a pinch, I had to go to a local clay shop, buy some red clay. So this top layer here is obviously a different color from all the other layers, but you know, that's okay. I kind of like the red color. So what I plan on doing is taking this last batch of red clay that I have, and I'm going to add some gray to it. That way it'll be a little less drastic in red color, be kind of a light red instead of a dark red. And then I'm going to make what's called earthen plaster over the exterior of the entire bench into one smooth final coat. So I'll show you all how I make that earthen plaster now.
because the plaster is the topmost layer on the rocket mass heater bench, you're going to be able to see any imperfections in that last coat. So straw is part of the earthen plaster that we're making, but this is a little bit too long. You really want pieces that are about a half inch or less because you want the little fibers to kind of blend in rather than have big old strings sticking up out of it. So the ratios for the plaster I made are two parts filtered sand for every two parts chopped straw for every one part hydrated clay and then you add one quarter part water. And I just had to pause here because my sweet little daughter decided to play with the straw and I thought it was too cute to not include. But anyway, don't worry, it's almost over. We're about to get to the clay. And here's the clay. So yeah, that's the hydrated clay. And if you mix this all up very thoroughly, like you're about to see, uh, it becomes a nice slurry and uh, actually wound up being a very nice clean type of plaster that didn't really have a lot of imperfections. So overall I was very pleased. And I took the care of chopping the straw and filtering the sand because this is the top layer so you don't want big blobs sticking up through it because this part actually does have to be aesthetically pleasing unlike the lumpy cob you've been seeing this whole other time. In preparation for laying the earthen plaster onto the sides and the top of the bench, I need to kind of give this thing a haircut. I don't want these big pieces of straw accidentally sticking out. I'm only going to lay a thin layer of plaster on here. If you leave these long, I don't want them hanging, hanging out of the entire surface. So I'm just going to trim these down all the way around the bench. I have never worked with any sort of earthen plaster before, but I figured I'd tool up first. So apparently this thing is called a plaster hawk. That's your standard trowel. This is a float. This guy's just a special scoop that you use to scoop plaster out of buckets. There is the earthen plaster. As was the case with previous steps, when you layer cob on top of cob or earth on top of earth, you want to wet the underlying layer first to get the wet layer going on to actually stick to it. Yes, baby. Mom, I thought the strawberries were, were, were good. You thought they were good? Yeah. Good, I'm glad. So, so Mom said she some for you. Okay. Did you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
So that was my daughter and wife telling me to come in. I am not able to though, because I'm working on this on my weekend. This is one of my passions, is doing crazy stuff like this. I only bring this up because I want it to be clear that I work hard in these videos, and I work hard to try and get them high quality so that I can improve the life of someone out there attempting to do stuff like this. The one thing I would ask, if this video has added value or knowledge to your life, YouTube will not compensate me in any way until I have at least a thousand subscribers. I didn't even know that until I started putting videos on YouTube. So would you please do me a kindness? If you've enjoyed this video at all, please subscribe. This time represents time I am not with my daughter or wife, and it would be lovely if YouTube would compensate me for this time. You don't have to spend a dime. All I ask is that you subscribe, and that will get YouTube to spend a dime. And thumbs up, and share it with people. All the stuff, just please do all the things to promote this to the point where I can get at least a thousand subscribers and then maybe I can uh, justify this time away from my family to everyone who thinks I'm crazy for doing this. Wow, talk about tight quarters. These are closed for missiles. Switching to guns. Because I'm not sure how much detail comes through in the video, I'm going to explain a little bit here what I'm doing with the trowel. So it may not look it, but I am angling the trowel. So the bottom edge of the trowel is tight up against the bench. The top edge is leaning away from the bench. Look at me trowel in slow motion. I hope this is helpful for someone. For the last layer that's going to be really smooth compared to this one i picked up a japanese finishing trowel to hopefully help me make it smooth and this thing here next to the fire bricks is often referred to as a cob rasp it's a piece of hardware cloth wrapped around a two by four block and then kind of screwed down with some fender washers to hold it in place but it's basically just little rough metal pieces that knock off the high points if I was better at this, I probably wouldn't have high points when I plaster, but I'm an amateur, so I had little peaks here and there, and that tool is just a nice way of kind of sanding those down so that they don't poke through the top layer I'm about to lay in a little bit here. I'll show that in more detail in a future scene.
So this is that layer of plaster about 15 hours after I first applied it. This level of hardness is called leather hard and you can see this corner is pretty wavy. I wasn't real satisfied with how it looked. So here I'm using the rasp and you just gently slide over the slightly wet plaster and it shaves off the high points of those waves. And then you take the finishing trowel and you keep it pretty wet and then you push in firmly as you slide the wet trowel across the surface of the plaster and that pushes the exposed straw back down into the plaster and you can actually get these wavy corners to clean up pretty nicely uh, so I just wanted to take the time to show you all a little bit about some of the finishing touches just in case you're not real happy with your initial results you can repair uh, the plaster or even cob you can smooth it out using these tools So anytime you light a fire in a rocket mass heater, it expands the guts of the stove. And what I mean by the guts is the bricks, the metal drums, and the metal ductwork. The heat from the fire makes all of those pieces expand outward. And so something that I didn't show until this scene here is that each time I laid any sort of earth material, whether it was cob or plaster, if that earth material is touching the brick or anything metal, meaning the barrels or the ducts, if the earth material is touching any of those parts, I always lit a fire while the earth material was still wet. That's because you want the steel and the brick to expand outward while the earth material is wet because that pushes the earth material away from the steel and forms its own natural gap. If you don't do that, if you never light a fire until the stove is absolutely finished, what happens is that stove is as hard as brick and when those internal parts expand outward, it actually cracks the final product and kind of cracks your stove. So light fires with each layer of earth material. You guys are going to have to forgive me for jumping back in time here, but it was necessary. I had to make a tracing of this brick before the plaster layer was sticking up above it. That's going to make sense, I promise. So I've been reading that one of these fire bricks tends to crack. I'm going to show you exactly what I have in mind to try to prevent that. I won't lie, this isn't quite an original idea. In the book I'm reading, apparently there's something they call a Peter channel. So, Peter, whoever you are, thank you for thinking that up. But the gist of it is, brick number one is here, and then down here is brick number two. Number two uh, tends to crack, and the thought is that it's because the flames blowing underneath this ashen edge you see here make the brick super hot on one side, and then on this side, fresh air is blowing in, which cools the upper side as the bottom half of it is being superheated by flames. And that discrepancy, super hot on one side, super cold on the other, tends to make that brick crack. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and make kind of a metal tube, and that will help insulate just a little bit between the brick and the flames themselves. I'm going to leave an air gap because as that steel expands from the heat, if I made a tube that's super tight in this hole, when it expanded from the heat, it would push the bricks out and crack them. I'm not trying to do that. And here we are again in the order of things. As promised, the arrow of time has been restored.
that about wraps this project up. I would like to ask you guys a favor. I spent six months of my nights and weekends making this video of this project for you fine folks, and I'd be lying if I said I didn't enjoy it, but I would ask that if you enjoyed it, or if you found it helpful, please do me a kindness. I humbly ask that you subscribe to my YouTube channel. It is the only way that YouTube will ever compensate me for any of this time. Let them do the paying, you just do the clicking. Uh, also, if you click that thumbs up icon, I hear it helps bump me up the algorithm. God only knows. And then, you know, I would speculate if you watch my other videos, that might help. And then if you know anyone as crazy as you and I are, then send them a link to this video. Who knows? Maybe they'd like it. Anyway, that's going to do it for this one. Thank you for watching this episode of Suburban Biology. We'll see you in the next one.